I fear sometimes that we worship God for what we can get out of him rather than just who he is. And uh, the Hebrew writer in chapter number three is reminding us once again of who Jesus is. We've already looked at Jesus is really greater than the prophets. Uh, we, we looked at he's greater than the angels. And now today in chapter three of this book, uh, the writer is talking about Jesus being greater than their hero, greater than Moses himself. Um, it, it's a powerful presentation. If you, if you study Hebrews, it, it's really a great comparison uh, with the old covenant uh, and the new covenant. And, and so Jesus here now is uh, being held up in great esteem great prestige, great honor above the hero of the Jewish nation. Uh, they, they held Moses in high regard. Uh, matter of fact, if you go to uh, Israel today, uh, they really believe more of him uh, in their uh, system of beliefs higher than they do even Father Abraham. Uh, it, it's amazing uh, how much uh, they revere the personality of Moses who, who, who led them out of Egyptian bondage. He stood before Pharaoh on their behalf. He was the leader of their nation and uh, highest regard now even among the Jews. Uh, let, let's pick it up in uh, verse number one. I want to talk to you this morning about Jesus, the head of the house. Jesus, the head of the house. Verse 1, Wherefore, holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling, consider the apostle and high priest of our profession, Christ Jesus. Now notice the little phrase there, if you will, holy brethren. What do you, what do you think that the writer is trying to convey here? What, what do you think that this means? Because I think it's really important that you nailed this down early on in our study of Hebrews because he reiterates this little phrase over and over again throughout uh, this wonderful book. And what he is referring to is the very end product of the Lord Jesus. He's talking about the finished product of the Lord Jesus, that which he purchased with his blood on Calvary's cross. Those that he redeemed, those people that had at one time in their life turned away from sin and by faith put their trust in the Lord Jesus and received him as Lord and Savior of their life, the finished product of Calvary. He identifies here as holy brothers. You understand that we not only have been declared holy brothers, we have been made holy brothers by the blood of Christ Jesus. So he, 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 he's not just giving us a title here, but he is reminding us that a change has occurred that enables us to be called holy brothers. I, I want to stop here just a minute and, and I want to share something. I want you to hear this. If there's never been a life change in your life, if, if that point that you look back on that you declare is the day of your salvation and yet no life change occurred, then you have no right to believe that you're saved. I don't care how many times, listen, I don't care how many times that you pray a prayer. I don't care how many times uh, that, that you go through the motions. If God didn't change you, salvation didn't occur. You count salvation because God says, I will make you a new creation. Old things pass away and everything becomes new. That's what he is referring to here in this passage that enables us to be not only declared holy, but we are made holy. Now, that puts us in a very unique fellowship uh, with people all over the world. And he identifies that in the next little phrase. Watch this. 
Holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling or sharers. I, I like the word sharers here. Sharers or partakers uh, of the holy calling. That, that, that word partaker there really comes from the root word koinonia, which uh, uh, means fellowship, if you will. Uh, that we have fellowship in this calling. We are sharers in that calling. I am grateful to God that the Christian life is not a solo experience. We have brothers and sisters all over the world. I sat yesterday for an hour and a half uh, with one of the most powerful Egyptian pastors. Well, he's one of the most powerful European pastors uh, in uh, all of the world. Uh, matter of fact, he has the only mega church, the only mega church uh, in that part of the world. They have about 15,000. And, and he had uh, two or three of his church members with him, staff members with him. And, and, and my spirit just bore witness, man, these guys are so filled with the same Holy Spirit that has filled me. We're not in this by ourselves. It's not a solo experience. We have brothers and sisters in the Lord all over the world. Mark, I, I don't know if you're old enough to remember. I kind of doubt that you are. Uh, but I remember in the late 1970s and in the early 1980s, right after I came here, the, is the church growth movement occurred. Now, Rick Calloway's older than I am, so I know that he's uh, very much aware uh, of, the, uh, of that. And, and here's what they said, that if you're going to grow a church, now this is in the early 80s, if you're going to grow a church, it had to be homogenous. You, you could not have a mixed bag of the culture and expect your church to do very much. In other words, uh, you can't be rich and poor. You can't be black or white. You can't be a white collar or blue collar. You got to all come from the, basically the same kind of neighborhood, drive the same kind of car, kind of look the same, have the same uh, socioeconomic uh, setting in, in the culture. And, and, and you cannot expect to grow a church unless it's homogenous. Now, I've got a word for that. Bunk. <laughs> you, you know, the scripture teaches us that this fellowship of faith is not based on human distinctions whatsoever. I, can, I, can I say that everyone is the same height at the foot of the cross? So, say, say we, we are... We are real sharers of the fellowship in the body of Christ. Last Sunday, I, I sat here, I almost brought to tears. Sat right over there in that, and, and our children's choir uh, was singing. Did, did you remember? And I looked up there and I thought, wow, we've come so far with the Lord. I looked up and there were, eight, there were all kinds of people up on that platform. Uh, they, they, were, they were black and white and there were Asians and, and everybody from every socioeconomic level that there was, white collar, blue collar, that they were all representative right up here. And I just smiled at myself and I said, thank you, Jesus. I, I've been here for 36, can, can you give me a personal privilege here for just a minute? I, I've been here for almost 36 years and I want to brag on First Baptist in, for just a second. I, I've been here for 36 years. And in those 36 years, not one person has ever made a derogatory racial comment about who is coming to this church. To God be the glory. <laughs> Praise his name. This calling. By, by the way, y'all ought to really think about this one for just a minute because th this is really good food for thought. And remember, it's, this Hebrew study is a comparison of the Old Covenant with the New Covenant. In the Old Testament, the calling was to a place. And I'm going I'm to I'm talk about that in a minute. This calling was to a place. But in the New Covenant, in the New Testament, the calling is to a person. And that person is none less than the Lord Jesus. And now, now notice this little phrase here in this verse consider, underline it, highlight it, draw attention to it, make some arrows point to it. It means to get fixated on. 
It, it means to embrace. It means to gaze upon. It, it means to get glued and intent. Uh, focus of your attention on, stare at him, get hold of him, understand him. And so he says, hmm, get your eyes on Jesus. Get a hold of Jesus. Now, here I want to make this uh, segue, if I can, out of the introduction. And I want us to focus in on what the writer is saying that we ought to focus in on. And I want us to focus in on Jesus for just a few minutes as we uh, bring this message uh, to fruition here. Now watch this. The first thing that I want you to see with me in focusing in on the Lord is that he is a messenger savior. He's a messenger. Write, write that down. He is a messenger savior. So, so watch it now in verse 1. Wherefore, holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling, consider, fix your attention... Grab hold of the apostle. Now, he's not talking about Peter, James, and John and the other apostles here. Here, he is referring to, here's what the word means, the sent one. That's what the word apostle means, the sent one. Focus your attention on that one that has been sent. The Lord Jesus Christ is an ambassador, if you will, uh, to us here on this earth. Do you know what an ambassador is? That one who has been sent. Do you know what the characteristics uh, of an ambassador is? N number one, he is clothed with all of the power of the sent country. And number two, he carries with him the voice of the voice of the monarch of the sent country. So here comes Jesus clothed with all the power of majesty. Here comes Jesus with the voice of authority of his heavenly father. Christ has been sent. Thank God he didn't just show up as a baby in a manger in Bethlehem. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. And then in verse 17, for God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. You understand, he is the messenger savior. He is the one that has been sent uh, by God. Here's, here's a neat thought. He not only is the messenger, he's the message. <laughs> Isn't that, isn't that good? The word says, I came to seek and to save that which was lost. I am come that you might have life and that you might have it more abundantly. So not only is he bringing the good news, he is the good news. Number two, he is a mediating savior. A mediating savior. Watch verse one. Uh, consider, focus in on the apostle and high priest of our profession. Uh, you, you understand that, that uh, he is once again comparing, and let me just say this, Jesus has no comparison. Shake your head like that, you're right, Pastor. So, but, but, but he's comparing the role here of the high priest in the Old Testament to his role uh, that God sent him uh, to do here on this earth. So, uh, you, you understand, while Jesus as the apostle, he was representing God to the people. But as the high priest, he is representing the people, this is good, isn't it, back to God. So he's that mediator. When, when you study the word priest, you know what you're going to come up with at, at, at its very essence? Bridge builder. The Lord Jesus is our bridge builder between us and God. So he then is our, our, our high priest. And, and I told you last week, I, I don't want to embarrass myself by telling you all again, but I think you need, do need to hear it. Some of you may not have been here. Uh, the high priest once a year would go into the Holy of Holies and he would... Uh, uh, carry a sacrifice with him and he would offer it up unto God uh, on behalf of himself and on behalf of the sins of the people. Now, 
Uh, it, it really didn't forgive the sins. It just kind of rolled things forward for another year, another year. And the high priest then would plead our case before God once every 12 months. Now, we're going to skip ahead just a little bit. I, I, I really can't wait uh, to get over there. So we're going to skip ahead. I want you to go to chapter 7 with me for a minute. And, and I want you to look at verse number 11. Hebrews 7. Excuse me, I'm sorry, chapter 9. Uh, Hebrews chapter 9, verse 7. Here he's describing the old covenant in verse 7. But, but into the second went the high priest alone. He went into the holy of holies once every year, not without blood, which he offered for himself and for the errors of the people. Now skip on down to verse 11. But Christ, here's that comparison. Being come in the high priest of good things to come by greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is to say, not of this building, neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood. He entered in once, not every year, not every 12 months, but one time into the holy place, having obtained. Not temporary, but eternal redemption for us. What a powerful word. You understand that Jesus became the once and for all sacrifice when he died on that cross. And when he shed his blood on that, Christ, on that cross, God graciously accepted that payment for your sins and for mine. Glory to God. Praise his name. That's good stuff. Now let me give you number three. You ready? A maintaining Savior. A maintaining Savior. Look at verse two. Who was faithful to him that appointed him. As also Moses was faithful in all his house. Now once again... Jesus cannot be compared to anything or anyone else. But here the writer is again comparing him uh, to their hero, comparing him to their deliverer, if you will, comparing him to Moses. And, 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 and the writer is saying Jesus is a faithful Savior, this one that we have received by faith and trusted him with our life that we walk with in a daily walk, the Bible says that he is a faithful Savior. Numbers chapter 12, in reference to Moses, the Bible says, my servant Moses is faithful in everything that he does. Everything that I've given him to do in my house, God says, he has been faithful. Faithful. Now, what was he faithful? Moses was faithful in carrying out the plan of God and in the will of God. So how was Jesus faithful? Jesus was faithful, first of all, in his teaching and his preaching and saying that he had stayed on course uh, with what God had given him to do. Second, he was faithful in his devotion to God. In John chapter 5, verse 19, he says, I do only what I see the Father do. So I've been faithful in that area. He was faithful to his disciples. Man, he discipled them, he molded them, he shaped them, he formed them, he fashioned them, he rebuked them. Every once in a while he had to get gruff with them because they'd get out of line. Oh, Simon Peter said some things that just really uh, was against and contrary to the will of God for Jesus' life. And, and Jesus says, get behind me, Satan. So he dealt with them even in the midst of their era. And he's faithful, number four, unto death. Even the death on the cross. I remember when I was leading music many years ago, uh, there, there was a song that I loved. I, I, I don't know that I ever sang it, but I heard it many, many times. My, my Redeemer is faithful and true. Everything he says he will do. Revelation chapter 19 and verse number 11, uh, John says, I saw heaven opened and behold a white horse and he who sat upon him was called faithful and true. 
Would you, li- would you agree with me this morning that we live in a culture, we live in a world today that doesn't think one thing in the world about going back on their word. I remember as a kid growing up, I mean, you, you say, uh, I'm going to do something. You just did it. Your word was good enough. You didn't have to sign anything. You, you, your word was just good. Why? Because people kept their word. But, but we're living in a day and an age now that, that this culture doesn't know anything about integrity. They don't know anything about character anymore. And they find absolutely nothing wrong with, with not keeping a commitment that they ha- have made in, in the midst of all of it. Matter of fact, I, I think it's probably the worst that it's ever been in the history of mankind. But in the midst of all of this, we have a Savior that's going to be faithful to the end. And my Savior tells me, I'm coming back. My Savior tells me that he's going to return. My Savior tells me that one of these days the trumpet is going to sound and the dead in Christ is going to rise first and then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them to meet the Lord in the air. He is coming back and I believe he's coming soon. Why? He's faithful to keep his word. Now, now the second thing I want to give you is he's a majestic Savior. He's a majestic Savior. Watch this in verse 3. For this man was counted worthy of more glory than Moses, inasmuch as he who hath builded the house hath more honor than the house. For every house is builded by some man, but he that built all things is God. Now here he comes again. And he says, in case you missed it the first time or two, I want you to understand Jesus is a whole lot more than Moses. Now, that's a strong statement because Moses is mentioned over 700 times in the word of God. And, and, And the writer says, doesn't even compare to Jesus. He's greater than the prophets. He's greater than the angels and he's greater than your hero, Moses. Now the little word house here, it's recorded seven times in these short few verses uh, that's here. And, And what he's saying here is that the builder of the house is greater than the house. What what do you what do you say? What do you think when you drive by some uh, magnificent structure. You know, the first thing that usually goes through your mind is, uh, I wonder who built that. I wonder who the architect was of that. Why? Long before, long, long before that ever became a reality, it was in the, the dreams of a man, the architect. So you want to know who designed that? Who, who did the architectural drawings? We, we were downtown uh, Charlotte on Thursday night, uh, went to this anti-abortion fundraising, uh, an amazing event. Thank God Fordham raised, uh, 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 right now I think it's right at $400,000 uh, to, to, to save little babies. And, and I went down and I got out of my car uh, right there beside the convention center and I just turned around and I looked. And all of those beautiful new buildings that they have built up there. And I'm thinking, God, who's responsible for all of this? Who did this? It's the right question. Let me just ask you a question this morning. When you go to work tomorrow, when you go to school tomorrow, when you're in your neighborhood, do, do the people in your neighborhood look at you and say, Wow! Who's responsible for that? Or do they say, Wow, who's responsible for that? Huh? Now, now let's think about that in the context of, of this passage. We, we're living in a world that is sordid and jaded. And the world is looking 
for something different. What are they? You, you've got to figure this out. You've got to get hold of this. We are God's house. And the word says, let your light so shine before men that they may see your building and say, wow. Let's give God the glory because he's the only one that could do that. Now he's a managing, four, number five, he's a managing savior. Watch this, five and six. Moses verily was faithful in all his house as a servant for testimony of those things which were to be spoken after. But Christ as a son over his own house, whose house are we? If we hold fast the confidence and rejoicing of the hope, firm unto the end. Now, you ought to know this. You may not, but you ought to know this. Old Testament, um, you, 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 the Old Testament, the house was a place. A house called the tabernacle that the Shekinah glory of God came over. Later on, the Shekinah glory of God came over the house, which was the temple. It then was identified as the residence of God. It was the address of God. God lives here. But in the New Testament, it's not a place, but it's people. The residence uh, of God. Can I, can I say that in, in the New Testament, the holy things are not festivals, they're not foods, they're not holy days. Uh, we, we, we don't have uh, ho holy articles anymore. The only thing that's holy in the New Testament are people. We are the house of God. We are the tabernacle of the Holy Spirit. And, and I hear people talk about, well, wh where are we gathering today? Oh, we're gathering in the sanctuary. No, 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 no. This is not the sanctuary. Thank God there will be hundreds and hundreds of people come today, park in our parking lot, and hundreds and hundreds of sanctuaries are going to come into the auditorium. But we're the tabernacle of God. We are the residence of the Holy Spirit of God. We are the address of God. Look at verse 5. Moses verily was faithful in all his house as a servant. He was a faithful servant for a testimony of those things which were to be spoken after. Moses was a servant. Jesus is the son. And one of these days, the son is going to take us all the way from here into glory. Do you remember uh, when the disciples uh, were with the Lord Jesus and Jesus says, who, who do men say that I am? And they said, well, some say that you are Elijah. Some say that you are John the Baptist. Well, well so what's everybody else saying? I want to know what you think. What do you think? Who do you think that I am? And Simon Peter, as he always does, so impulsive, but yet spot on on this occasion, said, thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. Then in Matthew chapter 17 on the Mount of Transfiguration, the disciples stepped out of line one more time and they said, hey, let's just build a three booths here. Let's, let's build one for John the Baptist. Let's build one for Elijah. Let, let, let's build one for Jesus here. And, and God wouldn't have anything to do with that at all. And he, and he simply said at that moment, or let's build one to Elijah, let's build one to Moses, and let's build one to, to, to Jesus. God wouldn't have anything to do with that. He said, this is my beloved son. Hear him. You understand, there's a big difference in a servant and a son. And Moses is not going to get me into heaven. <laughs> Jesus is going to get me into heaven. Look at verse 6. Now we're getting in deep water here now. But Christ as a son over his own house, whose house are we? 
if, you ought to underline the word if, if we hold fast the confidence and the rejoicing of the hope firm unto the end. Now you say, now wait a minute preacher, you've been talking about this eternal redemption, you've been talking about eternal salvation, but all of a sudden here's this word, if we hold fast our profession of faith, if we hold fast to courage and hope, uh, then, then we're going to be, well the word if there really is a very great word, uh, it's a descriptive word, but it's not a conditional word, and there's a major difference. He's saying right here in this passage, those who are secure are those that are holding on to courage and hope. You want to know who is secure? You want to know who is saved? You want to know who's redeemed? You want to know who is, uh, by the grace of God, on their way to heaven? It is those people, according to this passage, that are holding on to courage, that are holding on to faith, that are holding on to hope. You can identify them. It's those people that don't throw in the towel. It's those people that don't quit. It's those people who don't wimp out, but are consistently and constantly holding on to courage and hope. True members of the family of God, holy brothers, are recognizable. And they're recognizable because of their consistency and their commitment. If, if I had an observation that I could make today, if there has ever been a time in church history, if there's ever been a time in Christendom that we need men and women that are holding on to courage and hope and faith and commitment and consistency, it is now. I'm, I'm, I'm of this opinion, someday when we get into heaven, I'm pretty convinced God's going to say, why didn't you hold on more? Why, don't, why weren't you more consistent? Why didn't you trust me more than you did? Why didn't you trust me to the hilt? Why didn't you place your faith in the fact that I'm going to be faithful more than you did? Why didn't you trust me more? Why didn't you yield to me more? Why didn't you have the faith and hope and courage to trust me? Hey, hey, folks, I'd rather be guilty of trusting God for more than I had too little. Now hear this. Holding on to faith doesn't make you a child of God. It just proves that you already are. I want to ask you a bottom line question as we close. Do you know that you're saved? So, so what are you holding on to? Are, are you holding on to hope? Are you holding on to faith? Are you holding on to courage? What are you holding on to? Are you holding on to a baptismal certificate that you got baptized when you were a kid and you're depending on that baptism to get you into heaven? Are you depending on the fact and holding on to something that you walked down an aisle of a church one day and, and the pastor uh, received you and you signed some church membership card? Are you holding on to the fact, I, I'm, I'm a church member of a church? Are you holding on to the fact that I grew up with a godly daddy and a godly mom. I grew up in a Christian home and they took me to church every Sunday and, and, and I grew up with a great heritage and you're holding on to that. What are you holding on to? You understand when the grim reaper comes to carry your soul away, there is only going to be one acceptable response. So if you were to die today, do you have the assurance that you're going to go to heaven? And if so, what is that assurance? And God were to say to you, why should I let you into my heaven? What would you say to him? Well, you know, you know, you know, God, I've, I've, been, I've treated everybody the way that I'd want to be treated. And God, I've been going to church, you know, all my life. God, I taught Sunday school. God, I, I was a deacon. 
God, I, I, I took care of a lot of people. I, I honored my parents. Been a good guy most of my life. No. Friend, the only thing that you can hold on to is what Jesus did for you on Calvary's cross. And one day, somewhere along the way, you recognize that you were a sinner and you asked God to forgive you of your sin. And that day you turned away from sin and by faith you placed your trust in the finished work of Calvary. What Jesus did for you on the cross and received him into your heart, into your life. And there was a life change. Old things passed away, everything became new and you were a new creature and you've never gotten over it. That's really the only thing you can hold on to. And you just say, God, you know, the only reason you're going to let me in is not because of me, but because of your son Jesus and what he did for me. What you holding on to? God's people are recognizable, faithful, consistent, secure, holding on to courage, holding on to faith. doesn't make you saved just shows that you are thank you for watching decision for life our location life group and program information are available online at fbcit.org we hope you will take the opportunity to join us in person thank you from the family of first baptist church indian trail